a vast swaths, Ranger Patrick here, continuing our discussion about Boston during the golden age of piracy and some of the most notorious pirates of the age. As colorful and dynamic as this golden age was, it did not last long, approximately only 40 years. At its apex in 1720, there were an estimated 2,000 pirates active in the Caribbean, but within 10 years, their numbers would exponentially dwindle. Just as many intersecting events and issues led to the explosion of piracy in the early 18th century, multiple factors contributed to its rapid decline. One was Britain's rise as a naval power. Exemplifying the growing reach of the Royal Navy was Captain Rhodes Rogers, an English privateer from the War of the Spanish Succession. He was famous for plundering Spanish ships in an epically grueling voyage circumnavigating the globe. He arrived in the Bahamas in 1718 as the newly appointed royal governor. His forceful authority there deprived pirate crews of one of their few safe havens, which heretofore they had lived with immunity in a society largely of their own making. Rogers also brought word of King George I's proclamation for the suppression of piracy, issued in 1717 granting complete clemency to all pirates who surrendered themselves by September 1718. For many pirates who were aware their crimes would net them an eventual appointment with the hangman's noose, this amounted to a get out of jail free card. They willingly accepted this chance at a merciful reprieve. Another factor in the decline of piracy was the extraordinarily high attrition rate for pirate crews. As the examples of Kidd, Bellamy, Blackbeard, and Lowe have shown, the reign of most pirate captains was rarely more than two years. Later pirates would terrorize the shipping lanes of the Atlantic for only a fraction of that time. This was due to drowning, disease, combat, and execution. Between 1716 and 1723, an estimated 1,000 pirates were executed. In 1722, 52 members of the crew of the pirate Bartholomew Roberts were simultaneously executed in West Africa, the single largest pirate execution. Many pirates preferred death over indentured servitude in the British Royal African Company. Also, since 20 to 40% of pirate crews were of African descent, many of those spared ended up enslaved. By 1723, there were perhaps only 200 active pirates left in the Caribbean. Not everyone was about to give up piracy, however. One of the last with a connection to Boston was William Fly, whose career as a pirate lasted scarcely more than a month. In April 1726, Fly, a poor 27-year-old bosom's mate, sailed out of Jamaica aboard the Elizabeth and, sticking to the traditional pirate script, organized a mutiny, murdering Elizabeth's captain and tossing his body overboard. The newly assembled pirate crew sewed themselves a Jolly Roger, renamed the ship Fame's Revenge, and elected Fly as their next captain. Fly headed north along the Carolinas, capturing five ships and impressing more crew members. Fly was neither a skilled sailor nor a wise or lucky captain. Very few of the prizes he captured had cargoes of any real value, and one prize ship was accidentally run aground and burned. Fly intended to sail all the way to Martha's Vineyard, but the impressed sailor, William Atkinson, acting as his navigator, sailed them to Nantucket instead. Fly's fatal mistake lay in dispatching most of his crew after another vessel, leaving himself outnumbered on the famed revenge with only three other pirates and 15 impressed men. While Fly was absorbed in looking through a spyglass, Atkinson and the other impressed sailors seized all the unsecured weapons on board and made Fly their prisoner. Despite allegedly swearing a blue streak, Fly was promptly delivered to the authorities in Boston. There, Cotton Mather, who could never resist an execution, attempted unsuccessfully to get Fly to repent. Fly excused himself by saying, quote, our captain and his mate used us barbarously. We poor men can't have justice done us. All masters of vessels might take warning to pay their wages when due. 
before his July 12, 1726 execution, Fly and two other condemned pirates suffered through one of Mather's sermons, who castigated them directly by stating, quote, they die even without wisdom. Fly was executed in Charlestown, the same site where Bellamy's crew met their fate. Undaunted by the prospect of eternity or thousands of spectators, Fly verbally abused the hangman for his noose-tying abilities and insisted on retying the noose himself. After Fly's execution, his body was brought to the small island of Nix's mate in Boston Harbor, and there gibbeted as a warning to others. It was the same place where Blackbeard's former quartermaster, John Rose Archer, was also gibbeted and buried. The last pirate execution in Boston occurred more than a century later, in 1835, long after the Golden Age had ended. The condemned was Spaniard Pedro Gilbert, captain of the pirate ship Panda. Honestly, how does one go from pirate ships with names like Queen Anne's Revenge and Adventure Galley to Panda? Earlier, in 1832, Gilbert plundered the Mexico, a Rio de Janeiro-bound ship out of Salem, Massachusetts, saying, quote, dead cats don't mew, Gilbert ordered the Mexico's crew to be burned alive within their ship. Fortunately, the New England sailors were able to douse the flames and escape immolation. Gilbert was thereafter captured by British authorities in Africa, eventually extradited to Boston to stand trial. He was executed, like the pirates of old, by the Charles River, but this time by the Leverett Street Prison in Boston's West End. His body was brought to Charlestown, however, to be buried in a Catholic cemetery. Two decades later, in the nearby city of Lynn, Hiram Marble became convinced that the ghost of a 17th century pirate, Thomas Veal, was directing him to search for buried treasure at a place called Dungeon Rock. Although Marble spent decades excavating a man-made cave, even leading curious visitors inside, no treasure was ever discovered. Few other examples better illustrate how piracy had rapidly passed from an omnipresent threat to Atlantic trade to the stuff of mere folklore. In their heyday during the Golden Age, pirate crews were able to create small-scale democratic societies, often as a direct rebuke to the political, economic, and racial dictates of the era, but only temporarily. Their individualized nature and limited goals prevented them from instigating any overarching revolutionary change to the American colonies. However, the schism between North America and Europe that manifested itself during the Age of Pirates would widen all the way to 1775, exploding on a continental scale, eventually resulting in the American War of Independence.